Well, welcome. He's right. I have too many slides. And it says I have 45 minutes, and I've got 60 slides. So <clears throat> I'm going to get through them real fast. I'm going to drive through them. If you have a question, raise your hand. Um, but uh, I, I th every year give a talk about the jobs market. I think it's very important, especially given what we do for a living. And I'm, um, a lot of work has gone into this. So I want to uh, thank the team that helped me with this. In addition, I want to thank all of you, welcome you to our event. Looks like a good early morning crowd, ready to get going. We have a great event today. I think you're going to really enjoy it. Our whole goal here at Jobvite is that you get your money's worth. And hopefully, uh, I kicked that off the right way here. So first, though, we who here has seen uh, Pancake? That's great. Um, Pancake was a beloved member of the Job Byte family for many years. Sadly, we, we lost Pancake in the last year. And to show you how important recruiting is to me, uh, yesterday I interviewed a new top dog. And uh, I'm proud to announce that we have a new top dog, Meatloaf. <laughs> is Meatloaf here? There's Meatloaf. Yeah, great. Uh, so I asked tough questions, and Meatloaf handled it. I was quite impressed. And you know, I'm on a low-carb diet, so Meatloaf's a good, perfect name. So here's what I want to cover. Number one, I want to cover the labor market and eight major forces that are seriously impacting the labor market have been and will continue to impact the labor market. Uh, second, I want to talk about two things we can do as a result to, um, to navigate this, this market. Third, uh, who here has read about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in the last year? Well, there's a reason it's a uh, hot topic. And it's going to impact the actual labor market that we operate in. And then the final topic I want to talk about is how might it impact our profession of recruiting, OK? So first, I'm going to show you a slide of the United States. It's going to, as soon as I turn to that slide, it's going to start showing bubbles, blue and orange bubbles. And the blue ones are um, job growth, and the orange ones are job decline. By, you can see it on the map where it took place. It starts right before the tech bubble, around 1999, and it ends last month. So you can see this is job hiring in 2000, 2001, and then we had the tech bubble in California, and then we had a recession. And I want you to notice where all the orange bubbles are, by the way. And so then Katrina, which affected the automobile industry, and then look at real estate that's when the Russians bombed us. <laughs> and then since 2011, we've had the longest recovery since the Depression. Continual job growth nonstop since that recession. But one question I have for you is, where have most of the orange dots been? Right there in the middle. The, the Rust Belt, they used to call it there in the Midwest down to Louisiana. If you look at that number of years on this map, you'll see it's always right there. And then you can see in the coasts, a lot of blue bubbles, a lot of job growth in the cities. Here's another way to look at it. This is the opposite. This is the unemployment rate. So the peak of the mountain is the peak of unemployment. Starting in 1980, right when I graduated from high school, and then you can see unemployment rate drop, 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 drop. And then the 92 recession drop over a long period of time, then the 2000, and then that. That was a huge, huge loss of jobs. We lost um, 8 million jobs in 18 months. It was an enormous uh, recession. And the point I want to make there is that it changed everyone's perception of the job market companies laid people off in droves. So the first major force I want to talk about is the 
change in the relationship between employees and companies. These are all the recessions since 1973. The 73, 75 recession, I was like 11 years old, 12 years old. My father actually was a human resources executive at Xerox. And they were one of the first major US companies in 1973 to have layoffs. And we used to get phone calls at the house from angry people about the layoffs. And you got the 81 recession, the 90, 2001, and then 2007 and 9, the big one. The point I want to make here is in orange is the costs that were cut during the recession as a result of um, laying people off. And in orange, or the lighter orange on the bottom, are the costs of non-people expenses. See the big difference? In every recession, more and more of the cost cut were people. In the last recession, virtually all people. So a couple of points there. Our company's expenses in P&L is made up of people. And when, a, when the next recession hits, where are the cuts going to be made? In people. And they know it. So therefore, the stigma of being laid off is dropped, but the um, the assurance that your company is going to provide you a career path through a recession is gone. Point number two, the working age population around the world is dramatically shrinking. So in the, in the, in the pinkish color, 1970 to 2010, that's the working age population growth by country. You can see India, Mexico, US, China, South Korea. In the light orange is 2010 and projected to 2050. And it's ranked from fastest growing company, India, to the fastest shrinking uh, country, I'm sorry, not company, country, Russia. The United States actually is ranked two to be projected to have the second fastest growth but it's really tiny. What, what is the reason for that growth? Does anyone have a guess? It's immigration. If we didn't have immigration, that would be down where uh, the UK and Netherlands are. That's where the US would rank. Third point I want to make is that routine jobs are being eliminated fast due to automation. I'm going to talk more about that later. So you can see, and, and, and there's other data that would be interesting to show as well, that in every recession over the last four, the um, volume of routine jobs drops. And you can see in the last recession, boom, it dropped dramatically. Whereas non-routine jobs continue to grow through the recession. What's causing it? I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but it's essentially technology. The technology of automation that is, that is taking place right now is the merger of what's taking place on the internet with data, with software, with programming. And Bill Gates is so concerned about it, he thinks that we haven't even really thought of the policy implications of all of this over the next 20 years. Again, I'll say more about this later. Point number four. The job growth in the future <clears throat> requires an education. You can see the jobs that require a doctorate, a master's degree, a bachelor's degree, some amount of college, an associate's degree, is far outpacing the growth rate of those that only require a high school degree. But unfortunately, oh, here's more examples of this, by the way. These are the top 10 projected between two years ago and 2024 job growth categories. Petroleum engineer, software developer, I like the little mustache on the icon. Computer systems analysts, statisticians, information security analysts, right? They, they all require an education, the fastest growth categories. This is data from our own JobVite platform the system you guys use every day. Machine learning, or AI, has increased six times as a job title in JobVite 
since 2013. Robotics, four times. There's a new, there's a new uh, title, Autonomous Driver. I don't even know what, it seems like an oxymoron. Autonomous Driver, it's like a ghost. Um, the problem though, is our education rate is actually falling in the United States. In 2017, the number of high school graduates is projected to fall by 2.3%. It's crazy. And how well do we do in high school? In 1970, when I was eight years old, we were number one in ranking in the world in high school education. Now, I grew up in Southern California, by the way, and uh, uh, my roommate, my freshman year in college, actually was best friends in high school with Sean Penn. And uh, someone challenged me to do my, I got the perfect Spicoli voice. <laughs> it's really cool to have you here today. <laughs> All right. Whoa. 40th in math. Oh. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. So how are we doing in college? ACM is really the best, the, the peak, I mean, the top professional association for computer scientists, academics in computer science, professors basically of computer science. They have a contest every year. They've been doing it since, I don't know, I think the, I think the 70s, um, where universities around the world compete with one another to solve a nasty problem. Here were the winners in 1993. Surprise, surprise, right? Harvard, Stanford, Caltech. Here are the winners in 2011. My son's school, he's in computer science at Michigan. Yeah. And then last month, the winners. By the way, they're, they're all Russian, Eastern European, or Chinese. Who earns a college degree in the United States? Look at that. The wealthy, 40% or more, 40% go to college, only 6% of the poor. That was in 1970. So we've done a great job of increasing access to college for the middle class and above, but we haven't accomplished much for others. And you just saw all the job growth requires a college education. So hence, we have a, what I call a two-tiered labor market. One for people with a college degree or above or high skills, and you can see the unemployment rate now. Look, if you have a bachelor's degree, the unemployment rate is 2.7%. I mean, that's below what would be considered even normal in an economy. You guys are experiencing that live and in real time. You can also see the pay discrepancy between those with a college degree and those without. It's quite significant. So remember I showed you the decline of working population, the importance of immigration. Uh, every year I go to a conference in Los Angeles called the Recode Conference where a bunch of CEOs, tech company CEOs come and speak. In fact, Hillary Clinton spoke at it last week. But the talk that everyone has to see every year is from Mary Meeker of Kleiner Perkins. I'm only gonna do 60 slides in 45 minutes. She does 350 slides in 30 minutes. This was one of them, and it, her point was very important, that a majority of the most valued companies in the United States, both public and private, were started by an immigrant or a second generation immigrant. In fact, I am not the founder of Jobvite. I was employee number 10 or 11. It'll be nine years ago next month, by the way. And uh, the founder, the two founders were from Denmark. And Jesper, who founded the company, said they, 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 started, they came to the United States to start a company, because it would be too hard to do it in Denmark. Now, the share of foreign students that the U.S. has had always been at 25% for decades. It started to drop a few years ago. 
And now, suddenly, just after the election, look at the drop in application rates from non-US applicants to business schools in the United States. And what, what are they afraid of? They're afraid that when they graduate, they won't be allowed to stay to get a job. So they're not gonna apply, they're gonna go somewhere else. Maybe one of the universities listed in last month's winter. And if, in fact, uh, you stopped immigration to the United States, our workforce would shrink. Shrink quite significantly, that's about 10%. And again, 51% of the billion dollar companies founded by people born outside the United States. My um, father-in-law, who I've known since I was 15 years old, married my high school sweetheart, he was born in Germany. He now runs his own company that he started 25 years ago. In fact, next week he's flying the entire family because he's around 78 and getting old. He wants to fly his entire family to meet his family back in Germany. So our family has, has seen this in action. Um, 70% of billion dollar companies have an immigrant in a key management role. For every immigrant, 2.62 jobs are generated. By the way, every year we do a survey of recruiters and job seekers. We asked in the survey of job seekers, what are you afraid of? This is the percent they're afraid of immigrants. This is the percent they're afraid of robots. What are they most afraid of? Who here is Generation Z? You guys are scary. <laughs> my son is, gen my oldest daughter is actually um, Generation Y, so she's afraid of her brother. <laughs> Always has been, actually. And I think what's going on here is they're afraid of the technical sophistication of the emerging generation. Millennials, my daughter's generation, have now become this year the largest sector of the workforce. Woohoo! Yeah. And this is the projected growth. My dad's generation is not. I'm actually first. I'm, a, I'm like considered the last of the boomers or the first of Gen X, and, but the millennials now are in charge. And they're kind of like their boomer parents. But even compared to their parents, they really seek, when they look for a job, learning. And I argue that this is incredibly rational given everything that I've just shared with you. They know no company is gonna give them a career path so every job they go to, they've got to see it's gonna be another step in their career ladder. They have to construct their own career. They also care about, obviously, opportunities for advancement. But they're different in their priorities from Gen X. So, as I say every year, and remind people, it's very different. My, my father, the silent generation, uh, I'll never forget in 1995, a long time ago now, I was making this argument to the CEO and the senior management of the Los Angeles Times that we should create what, would we, what was later called a job board so that people would look for jobs online. And that the market was gonna increase because my dad's generation, they're gonna hold, they held four jobs in a career or will hold four jobs in a career my generation, and I was, I don't know, 31 at the time, we're gonna hold eight. That's double the number of jobs. Well, if you're a recent college graduate, you're gonna hold easily 15, probably 20, maybe 25, which means you're gonna change jobs every three to four years. So we have a serious problem. And you guys are feeling it, right? We have six million Six million job openings. A survey by PwC of CEO said this is the number one issue that concerns them, is the inability to fill their job openings. They can't grow their company unless they do so. 
This is uh, uh, a consultant at McKinsey. You can't have a growing economy, you can't have growing companies unless you have a growing working population. It's not possible. And the only way it would theoretically be possible is if productivity growth skyrocketed, meaning robots did a whole lot more. So there are two ways, I'm going to argue, we can act right now. Number one, you need to view recruiting as a marketing and sales funnel together, one funnel, starting with your leads at the top of the funnel, ending with your hires being onboarded into the company. Second, I'm going to say a little bit about our criteria, what we look for when we hire. So first, if you run a marketing and sales department, by the way, some people argue here in Silicon Valley that marketing and sales are two functions that are merging together. They call it smarketing. Chief smarketing officer. <laughs> uh, recruiting, I think it's the same thing. Marketing and sales merging together. You need to understand every step in that funnel. Where do they come from? When they come, how long does it take them to move down the funnel? What are the conversion rates? By the way, I have a friend, a big uh, recruiter and also consultant in London who said, we're not in the hiring business, Dan. We're in the, fire, we're in the rejection business. Right? The conversion rate, who, who gets moved down, who doesn't? You've got to build a brand that attracts the best fit talent, and you've got to have a great candidate experience. These are the statistics in Jobvite right now, year over year, the whole year of 2015 compared to the whole year of 2016. So. It dropped, by the way, if you look, 11% of visitors to our collective career websites converted into applicants. In 2015 and 2016, only 8.5%. It dropped. Well, that's because they got a lot more options. So they're being a little pickier. You can see, by the way, at the bottom, 0.2%, 0.3%. You've got a tough job. You've got to whittle it down to 0.2, 0.3%. You know, if you're in marketing, that's more like 1%. If you're in sales and marketing, that's 1%. This on the job by platform is where all the applies come from. You can see 34% come from your career website. Over 50% come from a paid ad on a job board. Job board like, might be Indeed, job board on LinkedIn. Very few applies come from referrals, internal hires, and agencies. But where do the hires come from? Your career website. Referrals jump up. Internal hires jump up. So job boards aren't as efficient. So job boards is a high volume game, clearly. You get a lot of applies, you gotta reject a lot. Each one of you has your own story and your numbers. You really need to dig deep and understand your funnel. Where do they come from? How do they get to your career website? What keywords do they search when they get to your career website? And how do they move down that funnel? How fast? Where are the bottlenecks? Maybe a hiring manager is a certain bottleneck or a group is a bottleneck. And again, build a brand for a career website and improve the candidate experience. So employee referrals, 80% of companies believe referrals yield the highest quality. You can build, marketers know you must build a database of prospects who are not yet opportunities for your sales team or qualified opportunities in your sales and marketing funnel if you really want to have a growing supply of customers. Well, we need to do the same thing in recruiting. You need to build a database of prospects who are not yet applicants, not yet in the ATS. 
and then run campaigns against them. On the candidate experience side, got to make it easy, got to make it fun. Um, you know, seven years ago, video interviewing was a little scary. Now, video screening's not that big a deal. And it can really dramatically improve the quality of your screening over a lower period of time. And there's other tools I'll be talking about more. Some companies, by the way, are commit. Anyone here do this? Try to get a, an answer to a candidate the same day as their interview? Some of you? Research shows that candidates really appreciate that. Quick, rapid feedback. This is another point <clears throat> last week that Mary Meeker made in her speech in front of a bunch of tech CEOs. That 82% of customers now will stop doing business with a company after a bad experience. And it's up from 76% in just two years. And every year, she says, it's been going up and up and up. Well, it's the same thing for our candidates. Candidates have a negative experience. When they leave, you don't give them the job. If they've had a bad experience in being rejected, they argue they're not going to do business with your company going forward. And they're certainly not going to say good things on Glassdoor or on LinkedIn or in social media. So if people are going to change jobs every three to four years because they want to get learning and experience to build their career, we've got to accept that fact. And you've got to create a brand that attract, continually attracts high quality talent. Where would you uh, like to work, by the way? Which place? On the left is kind of the cubicle. Orwellian hell that was kind of in the 90s, 80s and 90s. On the right, that's a, uh, who, anyone here knows who that is? It's a building at MIT in Boston, University. Why, why do universities build such fancy buildings? Part of it is the ego of the, of the people who write the checks, but it's because they want to attract the best students in the world to MIT. So my argument is that the most powerful people at a university, I worked at a university for four years, are the people who raise the money. The second, so your head of sales. Second most powerful people, people always say, the dean. Nope, it's the people who run the admissions office. Because every year, you have to bring in a new class of students, of high quality students, every single year. And some of them will graduate in four years. Most will graduate in four years. Most of your people will leave in four years. In Silicon Valley, the average churn rate is 25%, which means they'll leave in four years. Um, some will only stay for two. They're going to get an associate's degree and then take off. Some might stay for five and get a master's. Very few will stay for seven and get a PhD. So therefore, think like a dean of admissions as head of recruiting. Students, when they're looking for what school to go to, do a lot of research. They look at what are the classes, who's on the faculty. They're now, as you know, they're seeing who's Who's the CEO? Who are the people I'd work for? What's their background like? What can they teach me? Uh, every university president knows US News and World Report matters a whole lot. If you want to admit a great class, Glassdoor matters a whole lot if you want to admit a great class. I don't know if you know, but they used to require, they always would require an SAT. Who here had to take the SAT or ACT to get into college? Some universities now are removing it. They're trying to create a great applicant experience. So you've got to think carefully, what are the assessments that are going to work or not work? What's the apply process that's going to work and not work? Onboarding is important. It's, by the time someone gets accepted into a university, but before they start the first day of classes, there's a serious drop-off rate that drop-off rate affects their ranking in US News and World Report. 
So universities care very much that once someone's been offered an acceptance, even after they've said yes, that they touch them every week until they show up on the first day of the job. So onboarding matters. Obviously, you know, I don't know if any one of you have taken a kid to go visit university. All, despite all this I just talked about, they typically go on campus and go, wow, wow. Or if the person giving the tour is kind of a jerk, my daughter was, I'm not going here. I'm not going here. It's just the person giving the tour, Caitlin. What do you care? Not all students are like this. I don't care, Dad. I'm not going here. <laughs> I thought my son might be different. He's more like Spicoli. That person's a jerk. So my point is, people are making instant judgments based on the people they first meet. They're paying attention to your building. They're paying attention to your culture. So, <laughs> is this the interview of the future? Maybe. Second way you can act now is to, I argue, change the criteria. Every single job description sounds the same, by the way, but they always end requires a bachelor's degree. Blah, 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 blah. Well, do they really? I believe we gotta widen the funnel at the top and maybe consider talent a little out of the box from our criteria. And that's starting to happen with services like HackerRank where someone who Amazon was not in the habit of hiring, they hire Rizwana here who came from a very, you know, a very good university but a remote part of India. Typically, no stream of folks are going from there into Amazon but she did such a great job on HackerRank that it didn't matter what her typical credentials looked like to the recruiter, HackerRank proved it. More and more companies now are using games and simulation. What do these two people have in common? Anybody? They didn't finish college, or even go. By the way, who's on the bottom left? Okay, good, Harry Truman. Someone helping me the other day was like, I don't know who that is. It's like Spicoli's back. <laughs> Looks like my great grandfather, dude. So I think we should change the criteria on what we search for. Online learning is, the access to online learning is growing. Mark Andreessen was bragging last week at the conference about the number of people Udacity is now placing in companies, and people are doing career changes at Udacity. Like a math teacher here who got hired as a software developer. Second, see in the middle there, veterans? Veterans are a great supply of talent. The problem is, and some people believe, is that their experiences don't translate well into conventional skills in, in, the, in the domestic labor market. Translating those skills into our own terminology can be a challenge. So at Jobvite, if you want this on your career website, you can make this as part of the apply process. It's called the blue button. And instead of someone applying with their LinkedIn profile, we were the first recruiting software company to enable people to apply with their LinkedIn profile. This allows people to apply with their military profile and then will translate the job title and their skills into term and terminology that makes sense for the domestic labor market. Third is people in life transition. Uh, tomorrow there's gonna be a panel of CEOs, one of our customers' return path started a nonprofit that has been now spun out of Return Path called Path Forward, which works with to help women who've been working at home with their children re enter the workforce. They call them returnships. And so now companies 
they have really brand name companies um, here in the Valley, for example. They're headquartered in New York, but here in New York and other cities now who are, have a, an arrangement with Path Forward to hire on a regular basis women coming back to the work in a returnship. At Jobvite, we have a relationship with JobTrain. In the audience, actually, is an employee, Millie, who uh, went to JobTrain to learn how to build a website. So now, when you ask for help on your career website, Millie could be helping you with that website. So now my final topic of today, the only thing last week at Recode at that conference I was telling you about. By the way, you know what's the cool thing about that conference every year in LA? It's located at a hotel called Terranea, but 30, 40, 40, 30, 40 years ago, I served hot dogs there. <laughs> it's marine, it used to be marine land. And so, like, uh, I even, um, I, I worked at Yahoo a bunch of years ago, and the founder, Jerry Yang, and I were talking at it like two years ago, and I, I said, oh, wait a minute, this is kind of blowing my mind. So the founder and I are talking just 200 yards from where I used to serve hot dogs to dolphins. I almost got fired. I was taking hot dogs, and you know they would swim right up, just like a like a dog. And I give them a little hot dog, and all of a sudden I hear this not far down freeze iron six bar fight. I was like busted because I'm feeding the dolphins hot dogs. <laughs> Sorry, I was 16 years old. They didn't fire me. Whew. Would have killed my career. <laughs> so I think this stuff matters. The internet, the cloud. You hear. Everyone call it the cloud now. It's basically the internet. When you add devices, like uh, I call it my Sitbit, <laughs> and any other device, that creates data. When you take data and you combine it with increasing Moore's law, always improving computational power in smaller and smaller devices, you get machine learning, artificial intelligence. OK, who doesn't know what that is? That's a, a movie, 2001. How? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. You take machine learning and artificial intelligence, you add it to mechanical engineering, and you got robots. So machine learning, artificial intelligence, is really that thing in the middle. Sometimes it's connected to a robot, sometimes it's not. And it isn't brand new. It's been around actually for a while. When we ran Yahoo Hot Jobs, we had a machine learning algorithm that would figure out that you're a nurse in Seattle. And then we'd serve you a Hot Jobs ad for a nursing job in Seattle. But it's a big deal. Another point that Mary Meeker made last week at Recode is that we're in our third historic economic paradigm. The first pre-18th century was cultivating and extracting the land, agriculture. The second and it's manufacturing and industry, the Industrial Revolution. And she makes the argument that we are now in a third one, the combination of computing power and human potential, human capital. This is a quote from last week's Mercury News, San Jose Mercury News. This is a, a prominent investment banker turned into, he's, raising, he's raised a big round to finance startups. Every company has to understand this. So jobs that don't require formal education, we all know have been impacted by automation, and now more importantly, machine learning and Robotic automation. Robots are picking one apple per second. There's a defense contractor that will actually now make combat pants. Elon Musk, the founder of um, Tesla and SpaceX, brilliant guy. I, by the way, I interviewed for a job with him once back in, this would have been in 98. His first startup no one ever heard of called Zip2. I started what is now YP.com. 
internet yellow pages. That Zip2 was a competitor, and he wanted to hire a COO. I remember I had to, he wasn't the CEO, he was the founder. I had an interview with him. He was 23 years old at the time, and he's staring at my resume, like, from his, his face, and he never once looked at me. So you went to UCLA. Yes, I did. I did. <laughs> and now it's like, he's Iron Man, and he didn't get the job. <laughs> God. He's worried that 10 to 15% of all jobs in the world have to do with driving and what the impact of the loss of those jobs will be. Robots are now, for jobs that do require an education, are actually doing low-risk outpatient surgeries. A company that builds those robots just filed to go public last week, Friday. Oh, the one on the right, this is pretty wild. You can take a contract, scan it in, it will read the contract, and it will then, this machine learning algorithm will tell you where to negotiate, where to not negotiate, what's, what's legal, what's not legal. Yeah. So this is terrible, right? All jobs are gonna go away. I argue, and others do, that that's really not the case. As Mark Andreessen said last week, that's the lump of labor fallacy. When their power loom first came out, there were protests. People went on strike. People were certain that it was gonna be a disaster for weaver jobs. In fact, the power loom lowered the cost of cloth so much that it increased the demand of cloth so much so that there were way more weaver jobs than ever before. ATMs, they came out in 1983 or so I actually wrote a paper about ATMs back in college in 1984. For certain, it was going to kill bank teller jobs. It actually, it, it had the opposite effect. What it did was dramatically lower the cost of having a bank branch. So bank branches popped up everywhere. Therefore, there were more teller jobs. Car replacing the buggy. Mark Andreessen made this point to counter Elon Musk's point last week, saying, in fact, the car created paved roads, which created a construction industry like we'd never seen before, led to apartment buildings, led to suburbs, which then led to motels along those roads, which led to restaurants and movie theaters and so on and so forth. He makes the point, it's not a thousand X is what he said. He said the number of jobs created by the automobile were a hundred thousand X the number of jobs uh, that, or 10,000 X the number of jobs that that the, the, there were taking care of horses and buggies. But the founder of LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman, made the point, a very important point, transitions will be painful for those who cannot change or won't change. Hence again, education retraining is important. Every new wave of technology, in fact, has created more jobs. You can see the number of people in green on the top employed in farming. It has gone down a lot. Farm aid in the 1980s was to help the people who were having a tough time adjusting to that change. But collectively for the whole economy, way more jobs have been created. This is a little complicated looking slide. It's come from McKinsey. McKinsey has done a deep dive analysis of what are the jobs that are gonna be affected by automation. Okay, I'm gonna have to really hurry here. I got like five minutes, 10 minutes. This says, on the graph, on the y-axis, is the percent that a job will be replaced by some form of automation. And on the bottom is the percent of roles in the economy. Their argument is that about 60% of jobs will be about 30% automated. So in other words, jobs won't be eliminated, they'll be changed. So, Parts of what we do will go away. Most of what we do will stay, but they will change. If you're a clergyman, you're safe. Psychiatrist, you're safe. There's one job McKinsey 
said has been completely automated away in history that they can figure out. Anyone think, can guess what it is? Elevator operator. Most jobs have just been changed. Even CEO's jobs are gonna change. The McKinsey study says that 25% of CEO's daily activity is gonna be automatable, according to McKinsey. That's my plug for our CEO panel tomorrow. Matt Blumberg, CEO of Return Path, they're the ones who started Path Forward. Dan Rosenzweig, a colleague at Yahoo, uh, runs Chegg. Bonnie Crater, longtime Valley executive, Oracle, early employee at Oracle, worked a lot with Ellison has interesting things to say about their culture versus Salesforce's culture when she ran what is now Service Cloud. Chris, who runs Blue Jeans, he's really passionate about hiring managers being involved in the hiring process. So the future then, therefore, according to McKinsey, is working with robots. Maybe not that closely, <laughs> but working with them. Uh, one other thing, you know, interesting point is that the amount of data needed to teach a robot to take a lump of a towel and fold it up is staggering. Again, we're not going to be replacing our work with robots as much as training robots over time. Here's a survey, therefore, of the skills that you and we will be recruiting for this new robotic future. This is a PWC survey. They claim these are the skills that are gonna be needed going forward in the future. And McKinsey also said these are the skills needed for the future. It's remarkable how similar their analysis was. Creativity, critical thinking, agility, flexibility, because you're gonna be, your job's gonna be changing. So then I did the exact same analysis that McKinsey did on all those jobs in the marketplace and applied it just to recruiting. How might then this change recruiting? They essentially went through activities within a job and then they classified which of the activities are about managing, expertise, interfacing with people, kind of human, elements that cannot be replaced by a robot, and which are the activities that's more about the collecting of data and the processing of data. So coming to an agreement, negotiating an agreement with, an, with a hiring manager on what the criteria are, robots aren't going to do that. Writing a creative job description that people want to pay attention to, or video creating a video job description, being creative that grabs attention. Robots aren't gonna do that in marketing and they're not gonna do it in recruiting. Same thing with a career website. Engaging and persuasion to get someone to consider the job. I was having dinner last night with some of our customers and they were saying that that's the part of the job I like, the person sitting next to me was. That's the fun part. Selecting which candidates to interview, as you can see. But machine learning algorithms are gonna get pretty good They'll come up with your budget. They're gonna do all the job placement targeting. You won't be placing ads. A media buyer job in the marketing industry has all but disappeared in 15, 20 years. Same thing in recruiting, searching for candidates online. The algorithms will tell you these are the ones you should reach out to. So, the way it's gonna work in recruiting is that everything's gonna be tracked in the funnel. And the machine learning algorithms are gonna watch every conversion rate, and they're gonna get smarter and smarter over time. Wow, we tend to hire people like this, which could perpetuate biases, and you tend to keep people like this, which is a feedback loop that's pretty good. Ultimately, performance management data could feed into this. We've had, at Jobvite, machine learning algorithms working almost since the beginning. Our first machine learning algorithm was matching social profiles to jobs, watching on who clicked on who 
to recommend someone as an employee referral so that it would recommend others in their network that they could refer as well. Our next machine learning algorithm was right there in the middle, the auto scheduler, taking the schedules of all your hiring managers and the schedules of your candidates and calculating what's the most optimum interview schedule. And then over time, watching which schedule you pick to then pick up on your preferences. The third one, uh, which hasn't been really formally launched yet, but we, did, we have talked about it, is an, a machine learning algorithm to predict how long it's going to take for you to fill a job. And, and today, we're announcing our fourth, which is on the search results. So when you go into Jobvite and you're searching for candidates inside Jobvite, you'll see the match score. We've seen match scores before, but this match score is a machine learning algorithm that's going to get smarter over time. And it's going to watch which candidates that you click on, which candidates you don't click on, which candidates you spend time with, which candidates you don't spend time with which candidates make it down the funnel faster than others. And it will get better and better and better so that it can save you time, so that you can spend more time persuading the right people as opposed to be in the logistics rejection business. Make sense? One other comment I want to make about algorithms. Some people make the argument that well, they could perpetuate biases. They can. They're, they're inherently unbiased. What they recommend or don't recommend is a function of the feedback loop. I, th I found this fascinating that orchestras in the late 70s and early 80s started to realize that there probably was an inherent bias in who to pick to join the orchestra. So they started to move auditions behind a curtain so that you couldn't see, you could only hear. And there was a dramatic increase in the number of women selected for orchestras. So clearly, we do have those biases, but algorithms can help. And so we are now working on a machine learning algorithm. It's kind of in prototype. The purpose of it is to figure out if there's any bias going on on the Jobvite platform in any one of our customers. I don't know if we're going to share it yet, but in theory, Machine learning algorithms could help you stay within the guardrails. Hey, you're going off. You're, you're recommending the same kinds of people through your employee referrals. Or you tend to hire more people like this, and there's other people like this who, according to the match algorithm, should be qualified. So I believe the job. I'm going to give a plug here for a friend, Kevin Wheeler. Recruiting can be about influencing, listening, building relationships, coaching, and advising. Spending more time with people, more job persuading, less time doing the logistics, routine, boring, uninspiring work. By the way, Malcolm Gladwell figured out our intuition is almost always right anyway, so don't be so worried about these algorithms, or they're not as smart as how. They're not. Final thing I want to make, a point I want to make, is that recruiting and onboarding, according to BCG, Boston Consulting Group, are the two most important, valuable functions within human resources. And in fact, Glassdoor just yesterday, I think, or the day before, came out and said that the single most um, recruited and um, sought after occupation right now, according to Glassdoor's data, is recruiters. You're in demand. What you do is important. Helping companies build great teams, helping people find the right opportunities is very important work, and it's often underappreciated. I always want to make this point whenever I end a speech uh, to an audience of recruiters. So know this. Take this slide and show it to your boss. See? We matter. <laughs> I really appreciate the time. Sorry if I went over a little bit, but it's been great talking to you.